Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 14, Ghastly Game Nights. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. Patron of the show, Brian Kurtz, wrote about the Never Unprepared review. This was really fun to read. Since I own the book, and my thoughts mirror yours, and because, like you, I have heard Phil's evolution and more recent thoughts on prep. Do you still use Evernote on your iPod? Well, thanks for the comment, Brian. Um, as I mentioned in the review, rereading Never Unprepared was like a glimpse into Phil's past, which was pretty cool. It, it was an interesting thing, because as I mentioned then, I didn't know Phil when I re first reviewed that book. That was just He was just the name on the cover. And now I know Phil rather well, so getting to read something from that long ago was, was like a window to his past. That was neat. Um, now, Evernote, no, I do not use that piece of software, nor do I support them, because when I did use Evernote back then, it was a one-time fee to use, and I paid that one-time fee. So as far as I was concerned, I own that software. But then they decided to relaunch Evernote as a separate app with the same name and make it paid monthly. And I refuse to support them after that, after having already paid for something that they took away. So... We got a ton of feedback on our solo play, solo play episode. Yeah. There seems there are a lot of people passionate about their single player games. And here are some highlights. The solar play. There, there's, an, there's a totally different episode. We're going to have to do a, a thing on solar games. I don't think I have any. I have to think about that one. So Eric Farmer writes, Most co-op games are good solo. I like the Pathfinder Adventure card game, and I've heard good things about Arkham Horror Living card game. Suburbia has a good one-player version, as do a lot of the Uwe Rosenberg games, Agricola, Caverna, etc. Roll and Rights are good, too. Uh, Welcome to, which I guess is the name of a game, my side note. And Castles of Burgundy, the dice game, make good solos. A lot of war games can be played solo as well. Well, lots of great suggestions there. Thanks, Eric. Tommy Brownell also has some solo suggestions. He writes, I solo quite a bit. I love the legendary games, especially Marvel and Buffy and became a huge fan of Camp Grizzly. When I'm ambitious enough to break, out, break the whole thing out, I love A Touch of Evil, and I've recently become a big fan of Street Master's Rise of the Kingdom. Wow, so many suggestions. Uh, there, there are a lot of games there I've never even tried. The Marvel games are very cool. Uh, they confuse me a bit because they advertise them as co-op, but then there's final scoring, and then someone has to win. So I've seen it played where it's co-op until the last round where you screw over another superhero so you get the win. It's kind of silly. The rest of those games sound cool, though I don't play a lot of solo games. They do look interesting. So I've got even more solo games, this time from Phil Hatfield who uh, made a nice list. So solo-only games he plays. Raid on St. Nazaire, Hornet Leader, Friday, I know that one, and Field Commander Napoleon. Now, other games I can play solo either because they have rules for it or because I've created my own rules for it. Just about any war game without hidden movement, A Touch of Evil, Republic of Rome, Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition, Starfleet Battles, and 221B Baker Street. Wow. Thanks, Phil. One more from Sophie Legace, uh, a non-fantasy game that works well solo, Leaving Earth from Luminaris at luminaris.com slash leavingearth.html. Thanks, Sophie. I took a quick look at this one. It looks cool because it's a hard science game. You don't get a lot of hard science games in general. And a hard science game where you can play solo, that, that caught my interest definitely. That's one of the reasons I made sure to include the actual web address this time. So Mike Robinson writes, the best solo games, in my opinion, are Agricola, Mage Knight, and Pandemic. Gloomhaven is good for solo in theory, but it takes so dang long to set up, it's only worth it if you can leave the game going for a week. Well, we've definitely talked about that. You know, you need to have the table space for that game because, especially with one player, you, the value add for, for setting it up is just not there. If you're bringing over four people and you've got to, you know, and they can help, set it up and tear yes. it down, then it, it's a different, 
a different sort of economics. But if it's just you, yeah, you've got to be able to leave that set up. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks, Mike. Chris Groff on G Plus says, I like the idea of single player games, but in reality, I don't do it that often. Turns out for board gaming, I really want that social aspect. If I'm by mm-hmm. myself 99% of the time, I'd rather play a video game or read a book yeah. or research about games. Mm-hmm. Even games that I really enjoy, I find as a solo experience loses something. In fact, the only solo game that I did spend some time with is Arkham Living Card Game. I found it quite good and challenging, but even it lost its charm. That and I just don't want to keep up with the purchasing cycle anymore. <laughs> it started to add more complication and bloat than I wanted, so I sold it and pre-ordered the new Arkham Horror board game, which is solo a bull but I'll probably only ever do that once for learning purposes. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I, as we talked about at the top of that episode, that's basically how I feel too. When it's just me, I'm much more lo- likely to boot up my PlayStation or my PS4 and play a video game. Like, board games to me, I agree, are something I enjoy socially. It's something I want to do with other people right there at the table. Oh yeah, I think that's all the suggestions we got. I gotta say it was kind of awesome to see how much interaction and feedback we got from that last topic. Please keep the comments coming. We love it. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also find us all over social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Diaspora, MeWe, Pluspora. If you can find a social media site we're not on, let us know and we'll join up. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? So every week I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com. Now I have been really busy with Extra Life. Um, For those here live, Extra Life is this coming weekend. Uh, And she games and I have been busy with the final preparations for this year's event, and it's going to be epic. The problem is it has not left a lot of time for actual gaming. It's a tough balance, but I know the kids who will benefit from the funds raised by the gamers of Windsor will appreciate the sacrifice. Yes, that is the, that's why we do this. So I only sat down and actually played games one night this week on Monday. Now, on a positive note, that's now two weeks in a row, for those of you keeping track, that my Monday group actually did get together and we got to play. Finally overcoming that curse of having too many players that one night. Yes, it does. Seem, now, I will admit, we have not had everyone again. It's been three or four, and it keeps switching up. So the first game I broke out uh, was my shiny new Kickstarter copy of Endeavor Age of Sail. Now, I backed this at the top level. They called it the Commodore level. So it came with all the stretch goals and all the bells and whistles and all the shiny stuff. Uh, You can see uh, that yourself, actually, if you go look at the unboxing video I did, which you can find on YouTube, and it's actually highlighted here on Twitch if you go to our highlight reel, however you do that. This, this just looks so beautiful. I, I just hope it plays as well as it looks. Yeah, it is, it is a shiny, shiny game, and the upgraded components were very much worth it. So Endeavor itself is a modern classic. It originally came out in 2009. Now, this new version is a deluxification and an expansion all in one. As for deluxification, it's impressive. Uh, your chits are replaced by wooden counters. You've got a nice cloth bag to draw the counters in instead of having to shuffle them. The their plastic counters replace the wooden cubes. The player boards are inset. Oh, I love inset player boards. More inset player boards should exist in the world. Um, I got a really good note actually from, I'm going to forget his name. Yeah, I forgot his name. On Twitter, um, a user I interact with a lot who is visually impaired who pointed out how awesome inset boards are for that because you can feel where to put the pieces which is awesome. I, every game should start coming with inset ports. Uh, the plastic insert. This game comes in Rivals Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Like, there's a place for everything. It is so nice. You know, inset boards make a game, just really do make a game. Uh, even for those people who, who don't have, uh, you know, a disability or, or a, a mm-hmm. reason to need them. Uh, for instance, Terraforming Mars, I, you know, I've, I've only played it with the insets, and I can't imagine playing it without them. Uh, it, it just... You could see the potential for things to go sliding yes. around, and and no, give me that, 
give me that little little bit of this little bit of difference. Yes, that that little little bit, like just yeah, more games should have it. Scythe has it. Scythe is famous for it. It's it's starting to become more common. So please, game designers, I'll pay you the extra five ten bucks the game's going to cost. Give me inset player boards. So getting back to Endeavor specifically, I got to admit it's not all roses. So as you may have seen, if you've watched the unboxing video, I noticed it right when I took them out of the box. The player boards are worked pretty bad. And it seems like no stacking things on top or trying to bend them the opposite way is working. They're coming out bent every time. Those wooden chits I mentioned that replaced the cardboard, yes, they look great, but many of them were stuck together. It was almost like the production company, who I'm sure is overseas, produced it too quickly and didn't wait for things to dry before it went in the box. So stuff stuck together. So some of the chits came apart and a couple lost bits of paint. And while the player boards still work, I'm kind of bummed that they're they're bowed, right? So it, it's really disappointing to have something that looks so fantastic have these little flaws. And uh, just to go back a step, Ryan Peach. Uh, yes. At, at Red Meeple Ryan on Twitter Thank was the, uh, the user's name you were looking for. Uh, I also, doing my own little research, I was noticing a few printing errors that for at least people who received theirs in September. So I'm not uh. sure if you have a separate printing from that or not. Uh, but there were some, I mean, very minor, but they did have some printing errors that, that showed up on some uh, some uh, pieces. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you got to gotta be careful. And we talked about Kickstarter recently. Uh, buyer beware. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm going to have to check for the printing errors. I didn't notice anything on mine, but who knows? Maybe maybe there are issues. So the other part of the game, I mentioned the deluxification, right? So the other part of this kick, this new version, I'm, I'm calling it the Kickstarter edition, but you can buy it in retail. The retail version has these new rules and some of the deluxification. You, you get the, the inset player boards are not a Kickstarter exclusive, but the plastic pieces that replace the cubes are. I got a whole sheet that shows me what I got because I backed the Kickstarter. But anyway, the other part of this new edition of Age of Sale is a new set of rules called exploits. Now, I'd love to talk to you about these, but none of us have actually played the original game. So when we did play Monday, we just stuck to the base original rules. So I'm sure you'll hear about the exploits on a future week in review. So as for the actual game, it's a game where you're trying to earn go uh, sorry, it's a game where you're trying to earn glory by sailing out from Europe and the Mediterranean. You're establishing shipping routes and colonizing cities the world over. You have to build your industry, culture, finance, and influence. Well, colonialism, the board game. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty much it. To a point, I talked about this more on the blog, and you'll be able to see it there. Uh, this The game does include sa slavery and actually handles that topic very well. It's something that you can see addressed many places. Many people have talked about that aspect of the game. I don't think it's worth me repeating what other people have said, and plus I did explain it on the website. So skipping past that aspect of the game, which is historically accurate and handled well... Um, the game's fairly simple. Each round you build a building, you get workers, you pay your workers, then use those workers in those buildings to take actions. Actions generally involve you putting some of your workers on the board, swapping them for those chips that I mentioned earlier in order to reprove one of those four resources, industry, culture, finance, and influence. Now, I could go on and explain the whole game, but it's actually fairly simple. Like, there's you only play seven phases. You're only ever going to build seven buildings. At the beginning of the game, because you only have one building, there's only one possible action you can take. So I'm not going to get into details, but I went into a lot more detail over on the blog. And that's at tabletopbellhop.com on the table, where you can find out about this and so much more from the Belltop. So overall, it, it was simpler than I thought it would be, uh, in a good way. It, it was a quick game. Like, I expected a heavy Euro, and no, this was a, a lightweight Euro. It reminded me a lot of Hansa Teutonica, which I talked about in, pos in past episodes, which also sucked me in for not having a lot of different actions you can take and each action being very simple, but having a huge amount of options on the board due to the number of routes that leads to a massive decision tree. So you have simple options and not a lot of them, but lots of ways to use them or lots of ways to have those actions influence the board. Like at the start of the game, you probably have one action and it's probably going to be ship. 
But then you have to decide where to ship. So do you try to build a base in Europe or do you try to get a foothold in South America? Or maybe you're better off just sailing the open waters in the Caribbean to set up a front for occupation later. You still just have that one ship action. It's a big, busy board filled with a ton of counters and lots of place to do stuff. Now, is this uh, a place where you can get bogged down at the beginning of the game with your decision paralysis? Is that uh, a concern? It's, it's possible. Like, none of us had played before. So I just kind of went for one of the places. I, I started off and I decided I wanted to upgrade my buildings. So I just looked for a spot on the board where I would get brick, which brick represents industry. So I just went with that and went, okay, where do I have to go to get brick? Okay, well, if I go to, it happened to be North America. If I go to North America, I get a brick this turn. or oh, I improve my industry this turn. So I did that. So as long as you can think of something to do, but yeah, there were a lot of choices and I could see AP being a problem, but I don't, it didn't seem overly, not with the group we played with, I'd say. I, I could see it being a problem with someone who really, excuse me, really wants to weigh every option because there's an awful lot of options. Makes sense. So overall, I liked it. Um, it was easier to teach than I thought. It played way quicker than I thought. And it played quick for having that many options. I really do look forward to testing out the exploit rules. At this point, though, I'm pretty happy with my purchase. Well, that's uh, certainly a ringing endorsement. And uh, I think from anyone who's watched the unboxing will agree that uh, it certainly looks nice. Uh, and if it plays that well, all right. That <laughs> sounds good. So I talked a bit last week about the Kaido on Board Game Arena, uh, how Eric added in Crossroads, and it confused us a bit. Yeah, it was a subtle enough expansion that, as, as I mentioned last week, I thought the difference was just the character I'd chosen and forgotten about. <laughs> yes. Uh, so when we finished Endeavor, we had time for a second game because it was quicker than I thought. So I took that chance to grab my physical copy of the Kaido and the Crossroads expansion which sadly was on my pile of shame for like over a year. But reducing the pile of shame is always good. Getting games I don't have played played is awesome because the games you own that you've never played are kind of useless. Well, I can't imagine that couldn't have felt awfully familiar after how many times we've been, how many different games we're <laughs> playing Takedo online right now. Yeah, true enough. Uh, this was a three-player game. It went really well. The thing is, even playing online the last game, there was still aspects of... Uh, crossroads I didn't quite get. And it really helped having the cards in front of me. Reading the rules, for one, though the rules are pretty simple. When you get to a spot, you now have two choices. But mainly being able to look through the cards. So things I didn't realize was like what the calligraphy does. So when you get calligraphy, it's it's end of game scoring. When we were playing the game, I was like, by the time I hook a calligraphy, all the other players had taken other ones. So I was just given a choice of two cards. And I didn't know things like in this, most of the time, you get to look at all the cards and pick one. It's not random like the rest of the game. So learning little things like that did really help. Uh, it went well. Um, I really dig that having two options squares the decision space and gives you a lot of new choices. Yeah, no, it uh, it really does expand the options. I think on PGA, I don't think we've really seen it dramatically change the game yet. Uh, and, and I wonder if that's just because uh, we don't all necessarily know what all the cards are. You may have that advantage <laughs> now. Uh, knowing, knowing the potential, because I know I'm just kind of playing it by ear. And, and I'm actually, for the most part, playing the same mostly the same game that I was before. Mm -hmm. um, but I know I've got that option. If I need to land somewhere that isn't going to help me, I know yes. I've got that option to do something else. Yeah. See, so. that that's actually my favorite spot part about the game is every spot now has two options. So there's almost no wasted turns anymore, which was... I, I don't know if you'd call it an issue or a feature. Some people are probably on each side of the fence. But something I personally saw as a problem with the original game. Because in the original game, you could get stuck where, yay, I get to go here and do nothing because I'm at the temple and I have no money. Or, yay, I get to go to this vista, but I have all of that vista already, so I don't need this. Or I'm trying to think what else. I go to the place at the end and I have no money. So it did seem to help with that. So now every spot has an option. And, but it did cut back the cutthroat nature of the game a bit because now you're no longer stealing that last spot and forcing your opponent to take a useless spot. But I like that because the whole premise of the game is supposed to be this zen, peaceful journey, right? Everyone says it's the most zen game they own. 
Well, it's not that zen a game in the original rules because you could really backstab someone. So being able to remove that, to me, gets it back to the core theme of the game. You know, it's, it's all fun and games until you're fighting to get that last <laughs> Lake Vista. Oh, yeah, the five point. <laughs> that, that it's not even, it's eight point. points, right? Because you get yeah. five points it's, for completing the Vista the and then you get one. the three point bonus. If so it's an yeah. eight point tile. Yes, I it agree. Is. Um and it really, it's all about that Lake Vista. If, 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 you, <laughs> if you have that chance, I don't think anyone's even really gone for it in the five player games. The chances well, yeah. of actually finishing it are so slim. But in the three point, yes. in the three player games, you're, yeah. that's a. <laughs> well, it's also something you watch for. If you notice someone going for it, then you make sure to take a couple of those yourself so they don't get it. So the other thing I do like about it too is it, it does, um, there were some balance issues with the uh, the original game that people claim. Now, I didn't I haven't played the, I played Takedo quite a bit, but not a ton, but it did seem like the trinkets, the the souvenirs seem a little overpowered. If you got a hand of 3 and they were all different sets and you were able to buy those, you're probably going to win the game. I like that this offsets that. So there were a lot of new ways to score points. The other thing that's more common is it's easier to get money. So for example, for the vistas, instead of taking a vista, you can take a cherry tree, and that gives you a buck and two points. That buck can be huge, because money is scarce in that game. And then there's the new option to gamble instead of going to the farm, so you get a little push-your-luck element. Overall, i got to say, I dig it. Like, I, I really dig this expansion. Um, I, there's no reason I can see to ever play Takedo without it. If you're playing on Board Game Arena, just turn it on. If you don't own it, pick it up, I suggest. Yep. So... That's pretty much it for this week because there wasn't a lot of gaming. Now, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of gaming going on because of Extra Life. Now, the thing is, at Extra Life, there should be lots of gaming. So I was talking to Angie Games about this, and I haven't really mentioned it to Sean, but I have a feeling next week we may cut the answer question short. We may end up doing an Extra Life week in review, depending on how many games we've gotten played because... It's probably going to take a long time to get through everything that happened at Extra Life. We may answer one simple question, or maybe we may just skip the question and answer and just talk about Extra Life, kind of like we did for QCC. No, that uh, makes a lot of sense, because I know there's going to be a whole lot of reviewing. <laughs> yes. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 East p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. So tonight we've got Shadzar, uh, May Suggins, and Steve D has joined us, and uh, I'm surprised at how well our stream is running because we actually started on time tonight. Yes, uh, we've had a little. You might have just cursed it. We've had a uh, a little talk about trick or treating, uh, a, a little uh, a little tech discussion about uh, some of the visual difficulties we're having. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I do apologize I, for how blurry my video is. We, we can't quite figure it out. We're going to try some things during the week for next yeah. week. What we thought might fix it did not. For those of you watching on YouTube, you're probably confused because I probably look great because we are now trying to record my video locally, and then I'll send it to Sean, and he can swap up the video on the YouTube stream. So at least it'll look good over there. Okay. I do know we do have quite a few followers over there. So. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I popped a link for the Board Game Geek thread about the printing error that the, uh, the company did actually confirm. Um, oh. So it's not, a, it's not a huge deal. It's a minor little icon that's missing that basically stops uh, rule lawyers from <laughs> taking advantage of something. Uh, okay. But, but, it is a printing, but it is a printing error, so uh, something to keep an eye on. I'll um, have to check it out. Yeah. Other than that... Uh, Yep, candy and uh, candy and bourbon. <laughs> candy and bourbon. Bourbon. Is there like a hol There's got to be like a Halloween drink. Like you get eggnog at Christmas, right? And you put yeah. rum in it. Is there like a Halloween? Isn't that pumpkin like... spice latte? Isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's just like a September to October fall thing. I don't. I don't tie that one to Halloween. <laughs> I finally tried one. I had never had one before. One night, Tori and Kat were coming over to play Gloomhaven, and they're, they're always they always stop at Tim's. Like, you want anything from Tim's? And usually, we're like, Nah, no, nah, we're good, we're good. And I'm like, I don't even know why. I was like, Pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> they brought one. It it was okay. I yeah, didn't well, wait you, to see Tim the Hortons, buzz. I mean, Tim Hortons isn't the real thing. I mean, you've got to you've got to do the uh, you've got to do the Starbucks, Starbucks thing, but that's ridiculously expensive. So why? I actually found Seven um, uh, Eleven. 
hypocrisy that it may be, has really great coffee. Yes. Uh, and no, I agree. And 7-Eleven has one of those, you know, push button, mixed powder, uh, pumpkin spice lattes that are actually, assuming you can get it mixed well enough, really good. And I will take that over a $5 Starbucks wow. latte. Um, no, I do have to agree with you. 7-Eleven coffee is fantastic. And they have like flavors, they have decaf or not, and you can get flavor yeah. shots and the all the stuff there like being at a fancy coffee shop. No, I agree. It's been a long time since I've had one because there's no real 7-Eleven anywhere near here. But I did, when we lived next to a 7-Eleven, I picked up a coffee every day. Yeah, no, I, I, I miss I miss living next to one. Uh, I, I, I only ever see a 7-Eleven on the rare occasion I'm driving to one of our suppliers' locations. Right. Um, cause there just aren't that many around anymore. Um, at least. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot are gone here too. Almost all of them have gotten rid of the gas too. Yeah. Like now they're just convenience stores. All right. You can find us all across the web now and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform or more than one of your favorite platforms and help us spread <laughs> yes. our gaming advice to the world. Uh, we especially love Apple podcast reviews. Good ratings on Apple's mean we show up on searches more often. Showing up on searches is good because it lets people find us, people who don't already follow us on various social media or other platforms. Yeah. Uh, say what you will about Apple. You can love them. You can hate them. You can not care about them at all. But at this point, when it comes to podcasts, Apple listener reviews and star ratings are essentially the only thing that matters. Yeah. Um, if you if you don't have ratings and stars on Apple, you don't rank anywhere. Yeah, sad as it is, but yes, please review would be awesome. Uh, the other thing you can do next time you are online is sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, I'll be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released in the previous week. Uh, we're going to have blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, uh, weekend reviews. Anything else we create will be in the newsletter. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, I am working on something special that NC Games is pushing me to do. I think she calls it like a lead magnet or something like that. She's like the SEO expert, and she's the one that understands all this blogging stuff. I just like to write and talk. Um, so we're going to be looking at putting out something exclusive for newsletter subscribers. Uh, and if you dig Terraforming Mars, you might want to watch for this one. So recently we recorded an interview with game designer Phil Vecchione. In it, we talked about his new RPG, Hydro Hacker Operatives, where you play hydropunk Robin Hoods trying to steal from corporations, steal water from corporations, in order to improve their neighborhood. The podcast version of that episode dropped the day after our episode 13 dropped on YouTube as well. Yeah, it was a fantastic episode. It actually dropped today for those of you listening live or last Wednesday for those of you listening at home. Uh, I think it went really well. Uh, we talked indie RPGs. We talked cyberpunk, cyberpunk the genre, as well as authors. We talked Powered by the Apocalypse, what that actually means, uh, ash cans, game theory, and more. I think it's well worth checking out just to hear us geek out about RPGs. Plus, Phil's new setting fascinates me. Like, Phil is a, a cyberpunk aficionado. He's huge into it. He managed to take that genre and actually do something new with it, which I think is fantastic. I'm looking forward to playing again in that world. You know, Phil is definitely someone who thinks long and hard, not only about the setting, yeah. but the system. Uh, as we discussed, he's actually changed systems uh, yes. behind one of his games just because, you know, he, he found out that the, the system just wasn't quite doing exactly what he needed and giving his setting, the, uh, the feeling it needed for the game in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, so he went back and, uh, and reset to, to a new system. Um, it's clear listening to him talk about how much he really cares about uh, the systems he's putting out and the ones he's playing. He's already got a book on running games, as we've talked about, and um, was reviews, and uh, maybe we'll see one for players that's just as informative and helpful. Yeah, that would be cool to see. I, I'm hoping he was hinting at something. I'm not sure if it was a hoping or hinting. 
So yesterday, despite the never-ending cascade of technical difficulties, we did manage to record a bonus episode of Tabletop Bell Hop Live. Um, it's in a new format. Uh, I came up with the name The Break Room, since it's Sean and I sitting around, grabbing a coffee, and just talking about something important to the gaming industry. Now, yesterday's topic was Kickstarter, and we had a rather <laughs> animated debate about what it is, and maybe more importantly, what it should be. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it was a great conversation that I think people will enjoy. Sometime. <laughs> so we recorded this bonus episode so that we have an episode saved up in case there's a time when we can't record and we need to fill that gap and not skip a week. There's no telling exactly when this Kickstarter will go out to the public, but don't worry, if you've subscribed and we know you have, you won't miss <laughs> a thing. Yes, this is why everyone should actually subscribe to the podcast. Yes, I know I put up a link on the blog post and you can listen there, but you may miss that. You may miss these little bonus episodes we slip in, so please subscribe. Now, we are going to record another one of these, so another episode of The Break Room next Tuesday, November 6th at 8.45 Eastern, right here at twitch.tv tabletop bellhop. Now, if the podcast just came into your play this podcast just came into your podcast player today, well, that's tonight. So put down that podcast, listen to it later. We're going to be live tonight. <laughs> Sounds good. Nonlinear podcasting is so fun to talk about. I don't think we messed that up, but we'll see. <laughs> I think we got all the timing right there. So every week as part of Throwback Thursday, I'm going to resurrect an old piece of gaming content, something I wrote years ago on some other platform. I'm going to be republishing the original article, usually a game review, but it might be other blog posts. And then I'm going to add my thoughts about the topic now. So how do I now feel about this thing I wrote about in the past? Has my opinion changed? So this week's re-review, I took a look at the Masters of the Universe role-playing game by FASA, F-A-S-A. This was originally released back in 1985. Now, we spoke about this once already in our Worst Games, episode number 11, but this is much more detail. Yes. So, now I know what you're thinking. Anyone who's an RPG fan that is listening right now or looking right now is, like, clicking a browser and opening up eBay. Don't do it. Don't go rushing out to find a copy of this game. Yes, it is amazing that FASA, the people behind Shadowrun and Battletech and Star Trek, the role-playing game, did a He-Man RPG. The entire concept of that is is staggering and amazing and it should be wonderful but it's not that's actually why i republished this particular review every time this game comes up people flip out like 20 what 12 years ago when i first heard about it myself i did it i went oh my god there's a master of the universe role-playing game by fasa i went and bought a copy i managed to find an unpunched copy i didn't pay a huge amount of money for it but i didn't pay a small amount of money for it either um and then like, when I talked about it then, and I published my first review, other people did the same thing. So, now I had the worst of the worst episode, and I talked about games I really don't dig, games I played, and I talked about ten of them. And Master of the Universe was on there. And I shared links to the podcast and the blog post all over the internet. And again, everyone's like, oh my god, I didn't know that would exist. Like, people keep getting excited whenever I talk about this game, and people want to own a copy expecting this awesome game but it is not awesome it is so far from awesome please if you take no other advice from us <laughs> unless you're purchasing it as a collectible to sit yes. on your shelf it is worth nothing it is unplayable correct i like please people stop i felt I, as a public service i needed to get this review republished because people need to see this. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole thing. I'm not going to re-review it now. I talked about it in our worst of the worst already. If you want the actual details of why, like we tried to play. I did an actual play report. It's a mixed review, actual play report. Head over to the blog post. That's tabletop tabletopbellhop.com slash MOTU. That is correct. It's Masters of the Universe, M-O-T-U. I hope you can remember that. I just want you to know two things, okay? For one, it's not an RPG. It says role-playing game on the cover. No, there's nothing role-playing about this. It's not in the least. It's a board game. It is a purely a board game, a map-based countered board game. Two, it's a highly broken board game that is unplayable as written. 
we did the actual play and basically had to make up our own rules every five minutes just so we didn't end the game night because we couldn't play this game. So in order to keep going, we kept it going, I don't know, let's do this. Uh, it doesn't say this. Hey, roll a D6. If you get a six, it works. Like we, we basically had to rewrite the game as we played it. Again, it's not playable. You are literally better off watching a few episodes of the cartoons on YouTube mm-hmm. And making up something from scratch with a pencil and blank piece of paper. Yes. It would make more sense than what they put out. Correct. Now, what I will share here that I didn't talk about in our Worst 10 episode that I dug into while re-reviewing or re-releasing my review. So as I said, I'm going to give you my current thoughts. My current thoughts are the same. The game's unplayable. But I did some more diving into why. So I now know a bit more about what went wrong. So FASO was hired to create the game in 1985. They started creating the game. They got designers. They got artists. They got Epic Comics, which is the the little comics that used to come with your He-Man action figures. They got that company to design the rule book. So it's a comic. So all the art looks the same. Like they did some great initial work on the game. Then Filmation announced the cancellation of the show. Right while FASO was still in the middle of development. So someone at FASO, I don't have a name on this decided no one's going to want this if the show is not on the air. So we need to get this out in within two months before the show's canceled. They wanted it on shelves before the show vanished. Now at the time I can understand a marketing person making this decision. Uh, but it was a failure to understand the toy market uh, because I, they were thinking of it as a TV show and it, it was, mm-hmm. it wasn't a TV show. It was a toy and the toy, the, the TV show just existed to sell more toys. Yes. Um, and and what happened, of course, was while the show went off the air, the toys were all still out there. The people who loved the toys were all still out there. Mm-hmm. And those people would have bought the game, show or not. Uh, yes. The lovers of the sh- of the of the show and the game of the toys were not going away. They could have taken their time, but uh, they made a decision and. When they they yeah. and all the uh, all the purchasers had to live by. Yes, so like they didn't uh, th- they all they had a plan. Okay, so what they decided to do is we're going to rush this game, right? But they knew that rushing it's a bad idea. So the, what they decided to do is take the game, strip out all the role playing game elements, and just put out a board game, thinking this way people will get it, and then in the board game. They're going to put in a, a stinger. Uh, well, wait, there's more, right? Uh, but wait, there's more. Here you have this board game, but coming soon is this follow-up project that will flesh out the rules and make it into a role-playing game. The thing is, for one, they rushed it so much that pulling out their RPG elements made the rule book uh, incomprehensible is probably a good word for it because there's sections that reference things that aren't in the pot. Like it's bad. It's really bad. Again, go read the original review and you can see just how bad it is. So they put this game out thinking, well, this will at least people buy it and people will be hyped about it. And then they'll pick up the follow-up and get a full game. But the first game flopped so badly that instead of putting out that second product that might have completed this original game, FASA just dropped it and took it as a loss. If they'd taken those, six months even with the show off the air to create an actual product Mm -hmm. not only would they have made a decent income but they may have been able to hold on to the ip and kept rebooting it because he-man keeps coming back and she-ra the the ip keeps becoming relevant uh but instead they probably burned a lot of bridges yeah like, I don't know, like, FASA basically no longer exists, right? Like, they, they don't don't make games anymore. I don't think Mass of the Universe was their downfall. It's not like some of the stuff that happened with TSR and some people that got in charge and floating. Like, they, they fell for other reasons, but I'm sure that hit of the failed Mass of the Universe game was not good for their company. So, again, I will iterate one more time. Yes, it's awesome that FASA tried to put out a Master Universe game. If you look for it, Grenadier even made miniatures for it, and they are just amazing looking because of the old school Grenadier led miniatures. Like, it, it could have been amazing, but it's not. So, do yourself a favor. If you're a collector and you must have a copy, buy it. Just don't open it, make your, anyone play it. Like, be nice to your players. Like, put it on your shelf and go look at my shiny thing and say, Mo says it's garbage. We don't actually want to play this. 
and so just for anyone, uh, FASA closed their doors April 30th, 2001, but still exists as a corporation for the purpose of maintaining their intellectual property rights. So yeah, they, so... they are a patent troll, essentially, or an IP troll. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, that what they do is like Battletech is now put out by Catalyst Game Labs, but they Catalyst has to indicate that they are using FASA's license. Same with Shadowrun is also owned by Catalyst. Well, I think Catalyst actually, made apparently own... uh, Battletech and Shadowrun were sold to WizKids, who are then licensing it to FanPro and Catalyst. Oh geez, I don't even know. Whatever <laughs> gaming gaming licenses. Yeah, WizKids. See, I know they put out Hero Clicks based mechs. I've got one around here somewhere. I don't know where it went. I thought it was right here. They were pretty cool because they were pre-painted and they were neat looking. But anyway, yeah, so FASA no longer around except to try to keep some of their licenses, one of which is no longer Masters of the Universe. Yep. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. We also have our G Plus community. It's got a spot to put questions. I'm on Twitter pretty much all day. Uh, you can DM me there. Head over to f my Facebook page. Hit us up. Uh, we'll take your questions anywhere. If you want, we want you to be able to reach us. So get your questions to us on any medium you can. The bellhop is available. Just ding my bell. No, please <laughs> no. <laughs> now that said, this week we're changing things up slightly. <laughs> Uh, due to the fact it's Halloween, yes, hello, happy Halloween for those of you here live. For those of you at home, it was Halloween. Um, we are actually recording right now. It is Halloween, and we had a feeling the lobby might be a little light. And actually, no, the lobby's going pretty good. It's, it's some of our regulars. It's not packed, but it's good to see that some people did make it out. I was worried we'd have no one there. But just in case we had no one there, I wanted to make sure we took a break from your questions because I want to talk about your questions when you're here to hear it, right? I want everyone there. I want to interact. I want to, the big shows, right? It's a big deal. We're answering your questions. So I wanted to talk about something that fit the theme of the night instead of answering a reader question. That's right. So tonight we are, talk we are taking spooky, grisly, horror-themed board games. Uh, this should be interesting because my tastes don't really match what it seems like everyone else's are. Uh, like I Googled all the Googled it, right? And I'm like, okay, top horror games. And I'm like, huh, there's a bunch of games I don't like. Let's check another list. Top 100 horror games. Uh, no, I don't really like any of those either. Okay, then. I guess I got to go with what I actually like. Now, I'll admit a lot of this is because I'm not really into the whole Cthulhu thing. Cthulhu is just not my my jam. I've never really been into the mythos thing. Yes, I've borrowed Eugene's copies of the complete annotated HP Lovecraft. I read some of them. One was pretty good about some author and body parts being kept in a cabinet, but it's not really what I want in my gaming. Yeah, and I actually really enjoy the Cthulhu mythos, uh, but I enjoy reading the fiction. I love reading yeah. Lovecraft. Uh, playing a game that's based on a something that actually makes people insane I'm not really, not really feeling that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just not my jam. I, I don't know. People, there's enough people who love it. Fair enough. To each their own. Absolutely. So I did like we often do. Uh, this is going to be another one of those lists of games. Recommendations coming from the bellhop. Um, I'm going to break these into a few categories. Instead of just one big long list of 20 games, I actually don't even know how many games. I didn't add them up. It's probably about 15 or so. Um, what I tried to do, though, is list games to appeal to different groups. So different types of gamers or different groups of players. So we've got creepy kids games, cadaverous card games, Cobweb covered cooperative games and mutilated multiplayer games. It's too bad there was no C word for multiplayer games. It just would have run so much better. <laughs> so starting with the creepy kid games. Um, this is one that my kids own called Vampires of the Night. Uh, I should have noted it down. This company makes amazing kid games, whoever they are. I'm sure Sean will look it up while I'm talking. Um, they make really neat games that tend to use magnets and other physical bits to make the games more interesting. The best game they make is a game called Magic Labyrinth. Now, this has nothing to do with Halloween. I'm just saying that game company makes awesome kid games. Magic Labyrinth is a game where you put 
um, wooden walls on a map, and then you flip the board upside down, and then your pawn has a magnet on the bottom, and there's a ball, so you have to try to make it through the maze. And, well, if you try to move through one of the walls, the ball falls off, so it, like, literally feels like invisible walls. And because of the magnets, it's actually tactile. Like, you go to push, and you can feel that you're walking into a Very neat game. Vampires of the Night is another game that uses a magnet. Um, it's got this weird-looking purple magnet thing, and that's supposed to be a vampire. And then you've got a stick with a magnet on the end that looks like a little bat. And you're supposed to use that to move the vampire around. So what the vampire is trying to do is get all the garlic out of the area because garlics are garlic's bad for vampires. And the board has all these holes in it. So you're trying to manipulate this vampire to push the garlic so it falls down the holes for points. Very simple kids game. Like my, I think little G was playing it at four or five years old. Uh, wasn't great at it, but could move the thing around. It's it's slightly gimmicky. It glows in the dark, but hey, it's it's a pretty cool solid kids game that my kids still play now and then yeah no uh playroom entertainment is the uh the company uh the north american company anyway it's it's there's a, a german uh origin of it but uh yeah playroom entertainment and they do a bunch of games uh they do a lot of uh stuff a lot like the wooden puzzles that you'll see in the uh i've tried to yeah. remember, i can't remember there's a, there's a company that does a lot of really good hands-on tactile uh toys for kids and and they seem to be a lot like that Again, you know, it's gimmicky, but uh, it seems like a solid kids game. And uh, generally, four uh, the the bo- the box says six and up, but four and up is uh, the- no. It's there's uh, there's no reason yeah to to be six for that. None at all that I can think of. Well, like, really, it's, it's, it's a dexterity probably, game. It's probably one of those. The parts are of a certain size. Oh, that's that true. Means... You probably choke on the garlic or something. Fair yeah, enough. So uh, it's listed as six, but you know, if your kids aren't into uh, shoving things down their throats, go ahead and play them at four. <laughs> there you go. Actually, we had that problem with Little G. Anyway, <laughs> uh, up next, a uh, game I played at Origins. So we're at Origins 2015. First Origins I've ever went to. Deanna needed to do something she wasn't with me so i was sitting near the front booths and i got bored sitting at the front booths and around the corner was this weird monster on the wall and there was some woman doing demos of this tile laying game so i walked over and it was this game called monster factory uh by rio grande games and it is a really neat carcassonne light where you have to match up the edges of your tile and you have purple blue uh, sorry wrong word starts with the g green you have green monster bits that are tend to be fat and you have skinny purpley monster bits and you have to connect the green to the green and the purple to the purple. And there's like arms and legs and wings and warts and teeth and stuff. The important thing you're watching for though is eyes. So what you're trying to do is complete one monster by having it. So that like closing in a city in Carcassonne, you want no loose bits hanging off. Everything has to end. And when you do that, you get points for your monster and it's the points are the number of eyes the monster has, which I thought was kind of a neat way to do scoring. And when you finish your first monster you can then start working on minions which are other little monsters and they score differently to be honest off the top of my head i forget how minions score but it's something simple again you make the coolest looking monsters with this game like they just look neat my kids have spent hours just making monsters with the tiles plus it's a solid game like it was a good enough game that when d came back from the washroom or wherever she was she, i don't remember what she was doing maybe she was playing a game whatever it was she came back we played a game she's like whoa this is pretty good and we bought it right then for the kids paid full price i don't do that often <laughs> any game i'm willing to pay full price for must be good it, it's solid really neat game monster factory from rio grande yeah you know, and this has you know really fun artwork um, I, you know, I, I can't imagine any kid not enjoying just even just looking at this game and yeah. even maybe not playing the game, but just making and matching. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the, the first one I looked at it today, the first thing I thought of was an old matching set that I had of, you could, you know, take a, a top, a middle and a bottom monster and, and, and build your own monster. Oh, yeah. It was a very similar, um, very similar artwork to that. And my kid's still play with that occasionally and they're yep. far past this age. So no, I, I definitely recommend this one. Yeah, it's good. Uh, and then for kids games, best, the best for last, we've talked about this game on the show multiple times, ghost fight and treasure hunters. Uh, it's so good. I'm pretty sure I told the story before, but last New Year's was the first time ever we let Big G stay up late, and she got to bring her own game. So she brought ghost fight and treasure hunters. We set it up. And then as adults showed up, 
we played with Big G. So I played a game with a couple other people in Big G, and then I left, and then someone else played with Big G. And I think they played eight games she played before she went to bed. That game stayed out on the table until 2 a.m. because even after she went to bed, the adults kept playing it. Like, this game's fantastic. It's a great co-op game. It's a, like a really light pandemic because you're moving around a house, trying to get rid of the ghosts, at the same time trying to find treasures and escape with them. Um the big thing I'm looking forward to is there's an expansion that I really want to try. Something like the Hidden Basement or something like that. Add some new rules to it. I'm really hoping Santa may put that one under the tree this year. You know, it's a little light on the horror, but it's strong on fun. We've recommended it before, and I'm sure we will again. Yeah, one note on it, actually, something I, I should mention. There is a Ghostbusters re-theme of it called Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. It's the new female Ghostbusters. Which, actually, I saw the other day. I actually really dig that movie. I was very impressed by it. But this is much cheaper. It's only about, like, 10 to 12 bucks. But the production quality is way lower than Treasure Hunters. And I don't know why they went that way. Like, the pieces are about 20 to 30% smaller. The board is about 20 to 30% smaller. The card stock is almost paper-level cards. Like, it, it's... I like that they did a retheme, which is neat. Um, it does include some new rule for the giant, I'd spoiler if you haven't seen the movie, the giant Ghostbusters logo bad guy. Um, it does include him with some rules for him that I don't know. It was, I guess, a, an available expansion for the original game you could buy on Board Game Geek that they somehow included. But from what I can tell, every review I've seen is stay away from it. So one of our fans actually went and bought it thinking he'd be able to play eight player. By combining the two games, mm. but the component quality is so different that they're not compatible. Uh, up next, card games. I forget the cadaverous card games or whatever we called it. Um, one I dig. This is something I've owned for a long time. This is not a new game. It's called Spooks. Yeah, it's by Steve Jackson Games. We were talking about them quite a bit when we were talking about Kickstarter. Uh, they're also most famous for Munchkin. I'm sure everyone has heard of Munchkin. Uh, this is a trick-taking game that I have played with like my entire family. Like this is we get together for Thanksgiving with my aunts and uncles, and we can pull out spooks. It plays six players, which is a nice bonus, which is why we'd play that over, say, hearts or spades, right? So this allows more people to play. Uh, your suits in this are spiders, ghosts, goblins, skeletons, and bats. Uh, you're trying to match numbers, the highest number takes a trick but each suit has some kind of special rule now uh one of my favorite quotes from this is you don't have to outrun the monsters if you can outrun your friends <laughs> nice. uh now this is simple and fun uh it's a little older but it was re-implemented as muertoons in 2017 which is a day of the dead themed game based on a animated series by the name of muertoons uh, i'm not familiar with it but it had a cute little uh it had a cute graphic feel to it uh and it's it is still by steve jackson so um, you can probably get that one a little easier. That's cool to hear. I, I didn't know that. What's good to see? That's a good sign. That it's probably a good game. It's still in print, right? That's Vassal's Law in, in effect, right there. Any game good enough will be reprinted. Uh, the next card game I have is Unspeakable Words. Okay, I mentioned I don't like Cthulhu games, but really the Cthulhu theme in this is pretty far away from the actual game. So one of my problems with word games is I can't beat Anshi games. I it. I don't know many people who can. She has a ridiculously good vocabulary due to reading a ridiculous number of books. I've got a pretty good vocabulary, but not good enough to beat her. That's why I dig unspeakable words. Because in this game, bad words can be bad. So what happens is you get your hand of cards, you spell a word, just like every other word game. The thing is, for every card you use, it might even be point value, you have to roll a d20. And if you don't roll under your number, sorry, if you don't roll over the amount of cards you use, you lose sanity. And you have these little Cthulhu tokens you spend. And once you're out of those, you're, you're knocked out of the game. So you only have so many sanity points, so there's a push your luck. So if you try to do great big words, you may go insane, which I kind of fits the Cthulhu theme. Okay, I get it. I like the push your luck element, but I really like the fact that I can beat Enchi Games because if she starts building too many big words, she'll go insane, and I'm going to win with my cats, bats, and rats. <laughs> I, do, I do dig that. Now, this is older, uh, but the yeah. uh, deluxe version came out more recently, uh, and I have to say the uh, the Cthulhu minis in this are adorable. Yeah. They yeah, are they're, they're they're very close to the plushy Cthulhu. Um, not quite. I mean, they I think they tried to go on the evil side, but they didn't really do yeah. a good job. It's they're pretty cute. Yeah, they're pretty cool. It's neat components. Um, 
I dig it. One of the other things I like is I, not everyone notices this, but we were trying to figure out like why an A is worth more points than an O or why it's worth more points than an I or whatever. And it ends up that all they did was they counted the number of angles that are in a letter to get its score. So M's and W's are worth a ton of points, which I thought was an amusing way to score your word base game because it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, actual vocabulary or use of letters right. the other thing that's neat in the game that i that i hadn't thought of until i was saying that is you can make up bs words so that's another cthulhu thing like you can make up again fag of flag and then if you roll well enough or whatever people have to accept it i I've, it's been a little while since i played the game but i do dig it uh up next creepy cadaverous i don't remember what we put for the c but co-op games um there are some really solid horror-based co-op games now, zombie games, there are a ton. Zombies for the last few years have been hot, really hot. There are tons of zombie games. Hit Z-Road, um, Z-Pocalypse, uh, Walking Dead. I think there's six different board games. There's so many. Uh, the only one I've actually enjoyed out of all of them is Zombicide. And even with Zombicide, the only one I like out of those is the Black Plague version. Because I'm not really big on the zombie thing, but the Black Plague version makes it necromancers have summoned undead. So to me, it's kind of moving away from the zombie thing, and it's just I'm battling undead like in a D&D game. The weird thing about Zombicide that I didn't realize until buying the game is that it is basically a puzzle. So it's a co-op game where you have a set scenario... And you're going to figure out eventually that the zombies always move based on an AI in the game, and they always move a certain way, and they also spawn at a certain rate, at a certain pace, and so on. Now, there's dice and stuff to it, and there's some random elements where you're drawing like random equipment and that, but basically it's a puzzle game. And I dig it. It's kind of neat. One of the things I would have liked, especially in this version, is a campaign play. So we talked about the difference between scenario-based and campaign-based on the definition episode. So a scenario-based game is I could play scenario three, then I can play scenario one. And what I did in scenario one doesn't affect what happened in scenario three. I just pick and play. Whereas a campaign, when I do something in scenario one, it affects scenario two. I would have liked Zombicide a lot better if it had campaign play. It did not. It was just... Like I played, we played the missions in order one, two, three, four, five. But there was really, except for the fact it had a story, didn't matter what order we played them in, and didn't matter how well we did in episode one. So that was kind of cool. Would have been better if it was campaign. Now the other thing though is after playing five times, I kind of felt like we solved the puzzle. Like we kind of saw everything that was going to happen. So I had two choices. I found at that point, I could buy expansions because there's lots. And if I ever add an expansion, like just adding one set of archers to the game would completely change that puzzle. Like all of a sudden, I have all these new things to consider that could happen. And then I add, I add archers and dogs, and oh my god, now like that decision pace could explode really big. So I could go spend more money to make the puzzle more interesting, or I could sell the game. I will have to admit, though this is on one of my better horror game lists, I did go with selling the game. Uh, you know, I... I uh... I looked this one up on Board Game Geek, and wow, is there a yeah. lot of content. Um, it is a huge, huge IP. Um, I, I didn't bother counting. My eyes just kind of <laughs> no. glazed over as I, as I saw the pages and pages of uh, various uh, bits and pieces available for it. So, yeah, uh, it's you know, crazy. buyer beware. It, you, it, you, if, you, if you really end up liking it, you could end up spending a lot of money on uh, on all the bits and pieces of along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, but that's the whole thing with the game is right. It it's a puzzle, so to keep the puzzle interesting, you have to keep adding things to it. Which I get it. Uh, it just now the other thing we talked about yesterday a lot. This is a cool mini or not Kickstarter. So those games all kind of exploded with numbers of additional stretch goal content. I, I dig it. It's it's kind of a neat game, but I, as I admit, I did sell my copy of Black Plague. I considered picking up the newest one that's like Green Horde, so it's orcs instead of zombies. So I dig the theme, but I think I've had enough zombicide. Um, another co-op game I really dig is Ghost Stories. So this is a neat wuja game. So uh, Chinese mythology. So you are playing Taoist monks fighting against the evil Yu Feng, who is a, an oni, a demon. Um, you're trying to defend your medieval village from 
demons coming in and eventually Yu Fang is going to manifest if you take out enough of his minions and then you have one last ditch chance to take out Yu Fang before you lose your village. It is very, very hard. I honestly have played this game more than 10 times and have never won. This is a co-op game that requires a ridiculous amount of actual cooperation and working together. You go do this while I do this, and I'm going to try to do this, then I'm going to loan you this thing. It is a very cool game, and the fact I've never won, and I still consider it one of the best co-op games I own, is why it's on this list. No, I... You have to say it's not your Awuxia is not your typical Halloween idea. No. But you can't say that ghosts aren't appropriate for the uh, time of year. True enough. Uh, so up next, so these are the, the multiplayer games, the, the rest, right? They don't really fall into the other categories all the well. These are your multiplayer for three to five player games where you play with your regular game group at your regular game night. Uh, the first one is a game called Bring Out Your Dead. Uh, this is a pretty morbid worker placement game uh, where you are placing coffins uh, trying to get area control in the best parts of the graveyard. You're the head of a French medieval family. Uh, your family's importance, wealth, uh, well-being known, not well-being, but no name, family name, uh, is going to get better depending on where you're buried. So as your family members die, you try to secure them the best plots. Uh, this game has little wooden coffins that you put into little graves on the board. Actually, the graves are flat. This is this would be awesome with an inset board. It does not have an inset board. Instead, you place them on little graves. Uh, it's a neat action selection game where the cards are tarot size. It's got some really cool things to it. It's a very simple game that can be taught in under 50 minutes. Uh, quick, simple, bit morbid, and quite fun. Well... You know, going through this, I wasn't really sure if mass plague deaths count as Halloween <laughs> horror, but it's your list, so we'll go with it. Actually, what the game implies, I realize in the setting it's probably plague death, but what it implies is that you are killing off the other members of your family and then burying them in the appropriate plots to make your riches better. So to me, that kind of fit the theme okay. a little bit more, more <laughs> so than plague death. It's, it's implied heavily. Uh, you can see it in the notes. I put die when your family members die in, in the notes. You can't really see that when I'm talking. So, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's a c amusing game for, for a twisted idea. Um, next, next, Tragedy Looper. Uh, this is an anime-inspired game and one of the most unique games I own out of my entire collection. It's a one versus many game. One player plays the mastermind, and they know what's going to happen based on the scenario. Some tragedy is going to happen. In most cases, this tragedy is someone is murdered. Um, there is another one where uh, there's at least one where there's a suicide. Uh, there's a missing chilled child. It, it's some creepy stuff. The other players are trying to prevent the tragedy. The thing is, they don't know what the tragedy is, what's causing it, or how it's going to happen. So what they do is they move around the board doing things like talking to people and trying to influence people and cheer them up and stuff. It's weird. And then if they fail and the tragedy happens, the game resets. So time loops, a la Groundhog Day. So then they play again, and everything starts playing out the same. And if the tragedy happens again, the time loops again. You can get so many tries to prevent the tragedy. I don't remember the exact number of tries. The thing with this game is, though, is it is really hard to learn because it is such a unique premise and such a weird game that learning to be the mastermind is difficult, learning to be a player is difficult, learning how you're influencing the various characters and how you move around the board is hard. Um, it's Because of that, it wasn't very popular. So one bonus is you can find it cheap because you can find this in discount bins on pretty much every online store. Your local game store has probably got a copy that's been on the shelf since it came out. But man, if you take the time to figure this game out, it is one of the most unique experiences in board gaming. Now, this is a strong-looking game, but uh, the theme drift here is, is really pretty strong. Yeah. This, this really comes out more as a mystery, uh, clue-esque sort of uh, game than a horror for me. I, I, can see where uh, yeah, I, I can see where you were going, but uh, this, this this strongly says mystery to me. Okay. Mystery, horror, th there's some overlap there. Yep, yep, yep. I get it. This next one, though, uh, I, I think fits better. Uh, though I didn't at first, which is kind of strange. So the next one's Chaos in the Old World. Um, I almost, I, I just in my head, I didn't think Warhammer and horror. They just didn't click. But then it's Warhammer, and it's the Gods of Chaos, and it's Slaves to Darkness, and, and uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the other book. 
Slaves to Darkness, and I should know that. It's behind uh, me. Lost and the Damned. Yes, Lost and the Damned. Like, you've got the God of Pestilence and the God of Blood and War, and of course that's horror. What could be more horrific than the Chaos Gods and Warhammer? But for some reason, I just didn't think of it. Even though the map is human skin, and that's the map of the old world drawn on human skin. Like, it, it should have clicked in. And when I originally wrote the blog post, I didn't even think of it until I went in the basement and saw it and went, oh, yeah, that fits. Like, this is a, a really cool area-controlled demons and cultists on a map game. It's by Eric Lang. Uh, Blood Rage, Rising Sun, famous game designer, now works for Cool Mini, as we talked about yesterday. Um, this is one of the best asymmetric games that's ever been made. I still love it. I love the theme. You know, I, it's horror. It's absolutely yeah. <laughs> horror. Games Workshop knows how to make their demons and their chaos really unnerving. And they always <laughs> have. I think because we spent so much time sort of saturated in the uh, in the chaos mythos, <laughs> of Warhammer, uh, and there's also a lot of uh, comedy that they mix in to take the oh, edge yeah. off of the horror. I mean, you look at something like Blood Bowl, it is a horrific, horrible, horrific concept. So they have to throw in comedy to make it bearable because, I mean, it is just a bloodthirsty, nasty game that everyone loves because they've mixed, they've blended this horror and comedy so, mm -hmm. so very well. Yeah, there's something distinctly British about it too. Exactly. That that yep. style of humor. I don't know. I, I think you're right. I think maybe we just I got so accom accustomed to it. I'm like, yeah, it's just the chaos gods. That's not horrible. Yeah. Right. Uh, so a couple that I missed on the blog post for those of you who actually do like read the blog post and listen to the podcast. Thank you if you do. That's awesome. Um, I totally didn't think of these. Uh, the two games are King of Tokyo and Monsters Menace America. So the reason I didn't put these on the list is I was not thinking of giant monsters as horror though talking to Angie games about it makes sense, right? Like I think of back in the days watching uh, channel 50 with the creature double feature with count scary every now and then one of those double features would be some Kaiju movie movie, right? Like I didn't know they were called Kaiju then, but like they were definitely there. So I, I guess it fits right. Your Godzilla's your, your Godan, your Mothra. I, 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 I guess they're horror movies. Again, I don't think of them that way, but yeah, I guess they fit. So King of Tokyo is basically Kaiju Yahtzee. Uh, the kids love it. It's good with big groups. It's a great one for pubs, going back to our pub episode. You're rolling dice and playing King of the Hill with giant monsters. Very fun light game. Uh, an older one, though, from Avalon Hill is Monsters Menace America. This is a hex-based map of North America. It's a very light war game where you control one giant monster and one faction of the military. And on each turn, you're going to move your monster and move your military units. And with your monster, you're trying to smash stuff, because of course. And with the military, you're trying to stop the other monsters from mashing stuff. The actual game is fantastic, but then they put a really stupid rule that at the very end of the game, there's this giant monster melee beatdown where the monsters all just fight each other i love the game up till that point and i remember having a house rule to fix it though i don't remember what that is off the top of my head now this one is a rebuild or an improvement of an earlier version of called monsters ravage america uh which actually had an economy a cash economy built in oh, wow. and 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 some other complexities that i guess if from the from the reading i was doing basically just sort of made the game a little bit more complex and, and diminished the fun level of it uh, yeah. So they took those out when they uh, when they switched it over to Monsters Menace America, uh, and it sounds like they did a good job in uh, fixing it up. Yeah, I, I, heavier would be bad for this game. It's nice and light. So one last one. Um, I, I kind of had to put this on the list. I think I said I don't like Cthulhu games. I did recently play one that I have to admit I really enjoyed. So if you listen to our Tech at the Table episode, I talk about mansions of madness i've got to admit i was impressed I, I love the app it fixes all the problems i have with the original game i had a ton of fun playing that so this one i think does need to be on this list yeah this one had to come up and has come up many times in the lobby over the episodes this yes. game unquestionably has some very strong fans yes it does so Talking about our Tech on the Table episode, something else I totally didn't even think of when talking about horror-themed game nights is atmosphere. Like, this is huge, right? Like, not only do you need the nice pile of games to play, you got to do the whole thing up, right? Like, you want your soundtrack 
this night. Here's where you're going to go to tabletop audio and you're going to find creepy graveyard or you're going to find whatever asylum and you're going to play that while you're playing your creepy board game. You're going to find the Godzilla soundtrack on Spotify and put it on while you play Monsters Menace America. If you're got the hue lights, you're going to want to do neat stuff like have the flickering lightning going off every now and then or you're going to turn the whole room green or whatever. Like this is this is where like go overboard, right? Do it. Get, get get things going like go through that episode grab some of the stuff we talked about grab your sound boards go all out right props if you can find props right now is the perfect time actually here's a Tomorrow. totally unrelated tip <laughs> if you run role-playing games go hit the dollar stores right now not just for halloween you can just stock up on awesome prep props for your games not, right not now even just the dollar stores hit the hit walmart and yes. Halloween stores tomorrow as they're getting ready to pack up all those pop-up stores that are that need to get back out of whatever place they've rented for the month. Uh, you know, they've got stock that they need to get rid of and they need to get rid of cheap. Um, I have a, an entire fog machine set up that I use for photography as well as Halloween. And I mm. mean, I think I picked up five bottles of juice, a fog machine and a remote control for like 25 bucks because oh, wow. the day after Halloween. That might be my next step as a fog machine. I might need one of those. <laughs> you know, it's, you really can't. And, and you know what? I, when during our tech at the table episode, I preached a lot about, you know, be restrained. Don't overdo it. It's Halloween. Overdo it. Go wild. This is the time when you can. Uh, you know what? Everyone, everyone's expecting it. This is, this is the one time you're allowed to just sort of go nuts and have fun with it. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So Angie Game says, I am not putting a fog machine in our basement. <laughs> but if we get the new hue lighting, you know how cool that would look in the fog? I put the strip lights on the floor. It'd be amazing. Mm-hmm. One note, I went to Walmart today. They had no Halloween left. It's already really? all Christmas. Oh, yeah, wow. as of today. Well, here in Windsor, because I was looking for this. Well, I wasn't actually looking for this. I was looking for an alternative based on the <laughs> awesome tech issues that happened yesterday. Uh, I was there looking for cables, and they literally had no Halloween left. It was all Christmas already, the entire seasonal area, because I was also looking for a light to put in our pumpkins. Now, I don't know if that's true elsewhere, but here in Windsor, it's gone. Uh, it's, uh, they're, they're usually pretty uh, universally uh, uh, generic, so I think if it's gone in one place, it's probably gone everywhere. Yeah, it's probably gone. Now, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice where you'll see this and other questions answered in blog form, even though this wasn't actually a question this week. Yeah, I should have probably edited that. Just I, like, I did pretty I good at editing some of the other stuff. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't tweak it either. I got, I got some stuff too, but... Yeah, I got some of the stuff that I noticed because we're not doing quite, uh, not answering someone's question. We should have just said Mo asks, and then we could have kept everything the same. Uh, be sure to send us your questions, though, because we do normally answer your questions here on the show because we expected not as many people here for Halloween, though it is awesome to see that our chat room is growing and people are still talking. So fantastic. Uh, send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, Just a note, if you are a Patreon patron at the good tip or better level, uh, we'll bump your question to the top. So when you heard us answering Phil's question the other day, and we skipped over yours for Phil, that's because he sent us some money. And we like money because it helps make this show possible. And something's got to pay for this new shiny headphones and mic so that you guys can actually hear me as opposed to what you heard (laughs) yesterday. Now, speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark. A thanks and shout out to our brother podcast. Join Chris, Phil, and Bob as they talk gaming and game mastering. Now you can normally find them on 845 on Tuesdays, but not next week. You come watch us instead. Brian Kurtz, well, I know you can't make it to us. See the show live. Very much thank you for supporting the show. Duran Barnett, thank you. And Joe Swick, thanks. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Now, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday morning. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. 
For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.